Hello and welcome to another Karmic Channels broadcast. Throughout this Karmic Channels original Time to Heal series, we will be interviewing practitioners in their field of expertise in order to assist you on your journey back to health in mind, body, and spirit. It's time to heal with Dr. Kyra Messick, a holistic psychotherapist. Welcome, Dr. Kyra. Well, hello, Ron. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, would you please tell us a little bit about your origins and how that influenced your decision to pursue becoming a psychotherapist? Well, for those of you who don't know me, I am a yes, holistic psychotherapist, just as Ron described. I'm the author of a book titled The Strength of Sensitivity. And what I ended up doing in my career is specializing in sensitive souls, those of us who are empathic and often find life a bit uncomfortable. So the question was about my origins, right? <laughs> so my origins are, I am a sensitive soul. So I was a really sensitive kid growing up. Uh, life was confusing and difficult for me, and I really couldn't understand why the world was like it was. A lot of chaos, uh, a lot of mean kids, a lot of um, pain you know, that was around me. And so I ended up not really intending to go into psychology, but it happened. Uh, the universe pushed me there, and I ended up realizing that, well, like a lot of people who do go into the healing arts, we do that to understand ourselves and our families first, right? That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And I got a doctoral degree in clinical psychology, and this is my joke I tell, was after all of that, years of education, I came out of that knowing no more about myself than I did when I went in. <laughs> and so um, I then realized after that that, well, I'm a very holistic, metaphysically oriented person, and I had to kind of go my own way and learn my, do my own training after that. What did you mean by when you take a more holistic approach? Well, when I first started working as a psychotherapist, given the cognitive, behavioral, and types of uh, therapy that I was taught in my more mainstream type of clinical psychology counseling program, I would work with clients, and I just had that feeling that we're all like an iceberg. Our intellectual mind and the things that we talk about just in regular consciousness is that teeny, what do they say? It's about 5% of the iceberg that's above <laughs> the water. So really, I realized I could not tap in to what was really going to help that person make significant change and lead a happier life unless I could get to that iceberg <laughs> that was below the surface. Luckily, I was trained in hypnotherapy, which was unusual for a traditional psychology program, but we were trained in hypnotherapy. That was an optional thing. And so I started using that with clients. And then Wow, I, I really started to realize that this is more of who I am. Now that you brought up hypnotherapy, can you explain to our listeners more about that? Oh, of course, of course. You know, it's pretty misunderstood. And, and a lot of people um, are a little worried about hypnotherapy because of the uh, hypnotherapy entertainers <laughs> that are out yeah. there, the hypnotists. Mm -hmm. That's not therapy, it's hypnotists. They, of course, well, they know how to work an audience. Um, hypnotherapy... The other thing people tend to think is that it's going to be suggestions like um, if you want to quit smoking, there's going to be subliminal suggestions, or I would leave them with some kind of suggestion. There are a lot of different kinds of hypnotherapy, you know, just like if someone's going to go to a yoga class. Well, there's a lot of different types of yoga, so there's a lot of different types of hypnotherapy. And what I've always leaned toward is just a very simple definition, which is that it is just simply allowing yourself to open up and go into a different state of consciousness. Normally, people only go into these different states of consciousness as they're daydreaming, or as they're falling asleep, or maybe, you hope it's not when they're driving, but it happens, <laughs> you know, you zone out. And so, it's really not that different. I, I give a comfortable place for the client to go into a different state of consciousness which then gives them access to their own intuition or their own guidance. So it's less 
of me giving people suggestions and more of me helping people find their own answers. That kind of leads right into my next question in regards to what sets your practice apart from mainstream psychotherapy. What do you do differently? There's a lot of things (laughs) that I do differently. (laughs) Um, One thing I do differently is that I'm providing people with something that truly is different because they can go to a regular therapist, and actually a lot of the clients I see do that. They have a regular counselor that they go to for talk therapy, and that's a person they know that they can always go to, their insurance covers that, it's, you know. But then they come to me when there's a real stumbling block, or there's something that's just not shifting, or they know that they need, like I said, to access different parts of themselves, their intuition, or you know, really get through something that's been just a big block, you know, it's in their life. Mm-hmm. And so I like to get to work right away with people um, on that. So I do usually try to have people fill out a pretty comprehensive history so that I understand who they are. And then mm-hmm. they don't have to come in and tell the story to me all over again, like they have with all the other yeah. counselors that they've seen. That makes sense. And, of course, like we said, like I said earlier, I'm author of The Strength of Sensitivity, and so I specialize in working with sensitive souls, And so that sets me apart quite differently from a typical therapist. I'm there to help sensitive souls tap in with their strengths, which is, believe it or not, being empathic, which is being more aware of the subtle cues of life, which is being tuned into their intuition pretty easily with a little bit of guidance. Well, that's interesting you brought up the book. Uh, What was it that drove you or inspired you to write the book in the first place And is there much more involved in the book than just uh, your style of practice? Oh, yeah. That is quite the story, and so I will will compress the story (laughs) for you here, okay? (laughs) Because that's that's a whole other tangent. And and for anybody who does purchase my book, um, please start with the foreword. Don't jump right in Chapter 1, because the (laughs) foreword is a more... complete story of why I wrote it. Um, What happened for me was, you know, as I said, I was a sensitive, empathic kid growing up. And after I went did my formal education, I still didn't understand really what that meant. And what happened was when I was working as a psychotherapist, so it was my first job really after graduate school, after my internship and all that, I was working in a college counseling center. And Just to compress the story here, I realized what empathic really means. I was empathic. Mm -hmm. And that meant I was truly feeling within myself some of the things that my clients were feeling. Mm. Well, guess who were my clients? Everybody who was depressed, (laughs) had anxiety, panic attacks, um, had, had trauma in their lives. So I was truly, for a while, debilitated. And Mm. so confused because I said, oh, great. I just spent (laughs) tons of money and tons of time getting a doctoral degree in a field that I can't survive. But then I, but then I, but then as I thought about it, I was like, well, but I've always been that way. And really the gift of being a psychotherapist was that it helped me isolate. Okay. I just spent 50 minutes in a room with this person. It was obvious because what it was happening is I was feeling what was coming I would feel what they were feeling as they were feeling it. Then when they came into the session, they would describe to me what I was feeling mm, earlier. Interesting. I never let on <laughs> to that. Yeah. So I could so I could I had definitive proof to myself that that's what was happening. When you're an empathic person out in the day-to-day world, you might be picking up on things from your coworker, from the person you're sitting to, you know, next to on the bus from a family member that lives a thousand miles away, and you don't know, if people aren't telling you what they're feeling, you don't know what you're picking up on. So it actually was a great gift for me to go through that period. And so then I ended up having to do some research, and I did a ton of case studies. That's an official scientific term, a ton (laughs) of case studies, probably 300 case studies, trying to make this connection when a person describes himself as a sensitive person, and that might be more along the lines of 
okay, they feel emotions very deeply. They try to avoid arguments. If they go out to a mall or hospital, it's overwhelming for them, stimulus overload, all those types of things that a sensitive person might describe themselves as. Do they also describe themselves as empathic? And is there a link between those two things? And I found that absolutely there is a link. It's just that in our world, we never talked about being empathic. We didn't have, people didn't even have the language for that. And so, in my opinion, all sensitive people are empathic to one degree or another. That makes sense, yes. And that is what I try to help my clients with. So in one of your chapters, Dr. Kyra, you mentioned a little bit about the flower essence. I think you have one chapter dedicated for that. So this is one of many tools that you have in your your cache. Can you explain a little bit about the flower essence? Sure. Another really misunderstood thing, even more misunderstood than hypnotherapy <laughs> that we talked about earlier. Um, so another thing that makes my practice different from mainstream psychotherapy practice is some of the tools I use, and one is hypnotherapy. The other is flower essence remedies. Okay, everybody, listen up. Flower essences, I'm not talking about aromatherapy or essential oils. That's a, that is a different branch of herbalism. So I apologize that the names are so similar. I did not name them. <laughs> so yeah. this, this is just the way it is. Flower essences are their own unique branch of herbalism and working with the healing power of plants. They're a little more similar to homeopathy, which is the energy and, and a, a different... It's not the actual botanical matter, like if you had a chamomile tea you were drinking or a capsule you're taking. Well, it, this is the, and it's called an essence because it is truly the energy of the flower. And so people hear this and go, what? You are losing me, lady, you know? <laughs> and I have people, um, one of the reviews I have for my book on Amazon is a, is a person who got to that chapter and went, whoa, 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 hard stop. You know, I just, <laughs> they could not, they just couldn't even understand what it was. They couldn't take it in. And so this is for those of you who are looking for something that, um, that's really different and you know you need a different approach. They do work. That's the, that's the hilarious question I get. I used to get all the time from people. Well, I work with flower essences. Oh, do they work? Okay, that's silly. <laughs> <laughs> I, tr I, tr I try to use things that work in general. But, I mean, it's funny, and I, I don't blame people. Because when it's something you've never heard of, you don't even know what to ask. So that's how it comes out is mm -hmm. instead of, oh, tell me more about it, or what does that mean? It's kind of a mixed response of, does that work? You yeah. know, kind of shock. And it is shock, because we are taught in our society, bigger, stronger, faster, if I want more results, I'll take more, you know, and that's detrimental for sensitive people. Mm -hmm. um, we need simple remedies that are in harmony with our bodies and our nervous systems and who we are. So something like a flower essence remedy can tune in really beneficially to what we need. So flower essence remedies, um, any, any plant that flowers, a flower mm. essence remedy can be made from it. A tree, shrub, a weed, a, a rose, it can be anything. But each plant, and this is the same as herbalism, mm. each plant has its own healing quality. Correct, so the, yeah. when we're just using the flower of the plant rather than the roots of the leaves or the stem, it's very similar action. Like, for example, aloe. Everybody knows aloe vera. It's soothing. If you have a burn, you can put it on there. If you have irritation in your digestive system, you'll drink aloe vera. So guess what the flower essence of aloe vera is? It's for burnout. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it, it's just it's the same concept, but on a more energetic and emotional level. Can you enlighten me as the difference between that and, say, essential oils? It really confuses people. So, so I'm glad you asked. This is the second book I wrote. In the first book, I mentioned flower essences, and I realized nobody understood that at all. <laughs> Everybody thought I meant essential oils, and then they would go to a co-op and try to buy them because, of course, people are buying my book all over the place, and they would buy the wrong thing. 
And then they and then they call me and then they contact me. This didn't work. <laughs> what did you buy? Like I said, it's not what we typically see at the department store or at Walgreens right. or at Target on the shelf. The only place you can go and purchase these is a co-op or an herb store mm-hmm. that happens to carry them. But they still get confused with the herbal remedies. So here's the difference. So say it's lavender. To make the essential oil, they have taken a huge amount of those flowers. So think they go through the field and they harvest a huge amount of the flowers. So you have all this botanical matter. Then they take it and they distill it down into a tiny bottle Mm -hmm. so that it's very concentrated. So that's why you open up that bottle and it's like, woo, and you only use one or two drops. You don't go nuts with that stuff Mm -hmm. because it would be too much. So it's a ton of botanical matter distilled down to a small concentrated amount. It's a lot of physical matter in there. So if someone was going to make a lavender flower essence remedy, first of all, it needs to be an intuitive, sensitive person who really loves nature and can co-creatively create this with nature. Not saying that people who farm for essential oils are terribly different, but they're using a huge tractor or things like that, you know, Mm -hmm. to go in and harvest the plant material. To make a flower essence remedy, to tell the truth, all you need is one plant to get it started. Just the flowers will be taken from the plant. The plant wouldn't be harmed in any other way. And then the human being goes and really connects with that plant. When should I harvest the flowers? What, you know, what day are we going to do this? And tunes in about what specifically are you going to help people with? Because, yes, there's a theme, but there's a bunch of different varieties of lavender. It's Mm -hmm. growing in a different area. What's the difference between a lavender that's growing next to a tree versus a lavender that's in a lavender field versus one that's uh, in a pot? Very interesting. So so it can be different. And then um, usually it's put in water in the sun so that it's sitting there with the earth, and it takes a while for literally the energy of the plant transfers to the water. As an aside, if that sounds like magical magic, um, <laughs> magic magicy, magic I, I recommend Messages from Water, that book, by um, Matsuro um, Emoto, who is now deceased. But what he did in Japan was he, he proved that water is empathic and does take on the energies of anything that it is in contact with. So he took photographs of the crystalline structure of the water. And so that is a thing that's already been proven. Mm. So this is the same concept. So we're talking about vibration and frequency of uh, the matter of water. Uh, Can you repeat the name of that book again for our listeners? (laughs) I hope I have his first name right. I believe it was Matsura Emoto, but it's E-M-O-T-O, Emoto, and Messages from Water. He wrote. he, He did a few different books, but that was the... Yes. So the flower essences, the flower energy is transferred to the water. Then the water can be bottled. Then from that, a whole bunch of bottles can be made. So it's the opposite. One plant, a whole bunch of bottles of remedy versus the essential oil was a bunch of plants, fewer bottles. So in your travels as a holistic psychotherapist, are there any specific client success stories that stand out in your mind? You know, the best success stories, um, of course, I would say just about everybody I've, I've worked with. Now, there's a few people that come to me, and maybe they're just not quite ready to go as in-depth into their own intuition or trusting themselves. Mm-hmm. But the best success stories are definitely those sensitive souls who have always known that there's something different about them, and they, they really put their foot down about, okay, that's it. I'm not going to be uncomfortable anymore. I'm tired of worrying about what other people think of me. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, that kind of thing. And when people are at that point and they come to see me, they usually can make such tremendously fast progress Mm -hmm. because they're ready to tap into their intuition. They really just need guidance to understand that they are not as alone as they think they are. Mm -hmm. And that being sensitive does have its benefits. Being able to tap into your intuition and being able to connect with spirit and have that connection in life, well, that's what most everybody is actually reaching for. We have that built in. Mm-hmm. So it's just a matter of, of just some guidance for how to do that. 
and trust your intuition and your instincts. And then people really can, can come out with much more joyous lives, so much less confusion about what path to take, where should I work, what should I do about this relationship. You know, so much more clarity. I'm you know, very proud of the progress that, that a lot of those clients have made. Well, I think it's very honorable of you to, you know, put one's ego aside in explaining or revealing to your clients that they have the abilities, they have the tools, everything necessary to heal themselves, and you're just pointing it out to them. They can take it from there. Yes, and as I'm sure you've noticed, some people are ready for that, and some people aren't quite there, but that's okay. We're all here for a while, (laughs) and we're here for a number of years, you know, and so it's about being kind to yourself and where you are right now. And there's a lot of different practitioners. There's practitioners that can meet people every place that they are. Mm -hmm. So on to a lighter subject here, uh, something that I don't think you were necessarily expecting, but we understand you have two feline assistants in your office. Do you find your clients open up more with their presence and are they paid in catnip? Okay, (laughs) they are paid in love. Cats are amazing empathic creatures. They do get bored <laughs> when they don't have stuff to do. Mm-hmm. And so I have noticed that they, uh, they do like having people come in to our space and like, they like interfacing with people, especially because I am, I do specialize in working with sensitive souls. A lot of it is, I'll just be honest here, middle-aged women who are cat ladies. So, so <laughs> my boy cat just knows it. He can, he just knows when a cat, he's like, ooh, a lady who loves me is coming in. But what he does, my cat Merlin, he's a barometer of where they are when they come in. Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody is really agitated, he'll come and he'll say hi, and then he leaves. And they'll say, well, where'd he go? <laughs> and I'll say, he knows exactly where you are right now <laughs> and and he has good boundaries <laughs> you know? so sometimes people do need a little distraction yeah um to be able to feel comfortable doing some hypnotherapy or so if he's sitting there next to them it does help them feel a little more comfortable and it's kind of fun yeah. you know, having them there on that note, I, I used to work in an office where there's a little dog, one of those cute, cute, cute little tiny dogs. Mm-hmm. Oh, I miss him. Even though he wasn't my dog, what he would do, and my office was just the next office down from him, he belonged to the owner of the building, and when she was gone doing things, he would be alone <laughs> behind the little dog, you know, with a little dog fence. Mm-hmm. And uh, he would give me just this little woof, woof. And, I, and that meant he knew that the client I was seeing needed to see him oh wow and so i don't know if the owner ever knew we were doing this <laughs> i don't think she did and because and because her thing was don't bark you know and so he just gave that little woof, woof, and then i would go get him and he weighed as much like three pounds and then i would take him to the client and he'd sit on their lap for a little bit and then when he was done he knew that the client was calmed down or he did his job he would jump down and then i would go put him back in the office and no one was the wiser Fantastic. Wow. But, so animals are amazing. Well, besides animals outside of work, uh, do you have any interests, uh, personal interests or hobbies or anything like that that you like to engage in? Well, that was a wide open question. <clears throat> One of my favorite hobbies is karaoke or karaoke, <laughs> oh, wow. depending on how you want to pronounce it. I'm okay either way. And I have used that with clients, actually, because especially with sensitive souls, not being comfortable really speaking their truth or worrying about judgment and criticism is a component that really stymies and stifles a lot of sensitive people's amazing creativity. And so I have done that with clients where I will help them, I'll go with them. (laughs) I know where is a nice karaoke place that's calmer. You know, it's not like a bar full of a bunch of drunk people <laughs> yeah. that are going to, you know, it's less rowdy. So it's calmer. The clients that I've done that with have always said, oh, my word, that was so much fun. And it was so freeing for them to get up and just sing and just 
and some people, they never, I will say, they never belted it into the mic. I mean, it was never like just what, but for them, it was. And wow. it really was freeing for them. And uh, I use that too. I think it really helps singing, really helps move energy. And if you go to the right karaoke venue, there's zero judgment. Nobody wants anybody criticizing them when they're up there. <laughs> <laughs> so there is zero judgment, and it's usually just a lot of fun. It just makes so much sense, you know, using the music as a, yeah. a healing tool. Well, I think that's the end of this session, Dr. Kyra. We appreciate you being here and hope to see you again soon with other topics. Well, sure. Thanks very much. 